Okay, thanks very much for that, John. That excellent introduction, so that makes my job slightly easy. Air, but not absolutely easy. So what I'm going to try and do is give you some UK context at the beginning and just flesh out one or two of those comments that John made. And then I'm going to dive straight into a very complex institution and explain to you, partly in sort of theoretical terms, but really much more in practical terms, how we've managed to take that agenda forward about uh, open access and really about research data management in relation to that, that framework of, of open access and how the, the, whole, the whole position on uh, making content available uh, in different ways is, is becoming something that the library is, is really core, has a core responsibility for. Okay. So I'll cover five areas, the UK context, the Edinburgh context, the structure and the culture. I'll try and tease out some of these issues around cultural issues, and John mentioned those. Another one that's really important is reward and the reward mechanisms for academics as they move up and get their personal chairs and other things. And there is a bit of a clash there in terms of that cultural change and those reward mechanisms. I'll do some explanation around the, the library's role in terms of making RDM palatable inside an institution. Then I'll give you a position statement on where we think we are, we are at the moment, and that's changed even over the last couple of days with some of the exchanges we've been having in Edinburgh and, and thinking about systems and how our systems are going to evolve to accommodate this, this new data that we'll be responsible for. And then towards the end, I'll have five lessons learned and one question. So let's start off. What we, the approach we took in Edinburgh, and I'm sure it's the same in many institutions, was that we didn't come in, and John mentioned this about compliance and about research councils taking a, a view on publicly funded research and how available that should be. We find that compliance is a, is a difficult conversation to have with the academy. Because as soon as a librarian or anyone else from the sports side comes and talks about compliance, you can just see the the tension coming up in the room. So what we attempted there was explaining a problem and saying there is a problem with um, research data, how that research data is generated, how it's brought into the networks and how it's actually used. And then what do you do after you publish the paper? So we tried to explain some of those problems and that worked quite well to start a conversation off. And there's many, many examples of this, the, the basic problem, the basic issue of doing research. And anyone who's done research, you, you catch that issue, that once you've got the research output, there's, there's data left. There's data left that actually is absolutely central to the scholarly output. And then there's data left and you say, well, I'm going to do something with that later on. That's going to be another article. So there's various issues here. And I've put up in the slide a couple of ones that we like anyway, explaining that basic problem. What we had also done in Edinburgh, and we, I think we were a bit uh, ahead of the, the, the curve with this, is looking at auditing what actually the practice was inside the university. And what we found was a lot of uneven practices, you can, you can imagine, discipline differences, different ways of actually uh, carrying out research and also uh, managing that research uh, immediately and in the longer term. So these are a few of the things that we've done. But again, that sentence there is the, is the approach we took. It's quite open and quite talkative in the sense of what can we do to help you. So what could be done in respect of storage services, facilities and policies to make your research at Edinburgh easier, better, more competitive or more successful? So that drive to be competing with the best to get grants and to do other things and really playing into their, their need to, to, to deliver at a high level in a high performing uni university. And that led progressively towards the research data management policy that came out in 2011 and that was one of the first research data management policies, an institutional one that was produced in, in the UK. While all that was going on, there's this external context that John alluded to and the OECD, there's very many, many statements have been said about this notion of data as well as open access publications being a public good that should be made available. So there is that really, really compelling argument that I don't think I've ever heard anyone argue confidently against, against in any meaningful way. Research Council UK, John's mentioned as well. And the, the research funder looking at data policies and they're increasingly demanding of institutional commitment 
and provision. And again, that was another thing we picked up, up in Edinburgh in the initial conversations. The university at this stage in its development is a research intensive university, wants to make a commitment to you and will provide certain things free at point of delivery for you. So it's rather about compliance and offering systems and support that will allow researchers to do their, their, their research more comfortably in a more secure environment as they see it. And then Research Council statement just below there, same kind of thing, trying to pull things together in an overarching framework. But very common principles coming through externally that have to be delivered inside the academy, academy in a palatable way, in a meaningful way, in a way where it's not just big stick all the time. One of the documents we refer to quite a lot, we've got the DCC, the Digital Creation Centre, who have been very helpful and useful in helping us to understand the various uh, complexities of research data policies from the funding councils, and there's quite a few of them there, and it's a very useful diagram. And you can see there's very much a mixed approach there. So there can be confusion with this, it's quite complicated, and there is an expectation that librarians and others in the support area will understand that a bit more. A couple of words about Edinburgh University. It, it's a large university. Well, I think it's a large university. 32,000 students. Student numbers have gone up quite a bit. The, probably the thing we would focus on is the academic staff. Headcount of about over 6,000. Oh, sorry, uh, FTE of over 6,000. About a headcount of about over 9,000. And this important statistic that eventually dawned on me in conversations we were having, 50% of the IT is done centrally, and 50% of it is done locally. So th there is something there that, that can help you understand the complexity of the organisation. They're done in central areas, but also lots and lots of IT provision provided in schools and in, in the colleges. We've got 10, 22 schools there. And just below the nice picture of Old College, you can see the number of research grants in 2012-13. So quite a significant turnover of research grants externally from research councils and others, and a reasonable success rate, and a figure of about 300 million coming in. Importantly, there is the fact that a lot of them are collaborative internally with research teams in the university, and externally with external uh, partners. So that brings another layer of complexity and issue with sharing data and understanding how uh, provision could be made that doesn't get in the way of research and, and, and collaboration and, and actually facilitates it, makes it a bit easier. We in Edinburgh have a structure, which I'm part of, which is a converged IT and library service structure. Now, in the UK, my colleagues will know this from the UK, that's quite unusual at this level, in the Russell Group level, to have that converged service. It is IT and library services, and it the argument goes in Edinburgh that for things like research data management, it makes it easier if you're all in the same administrative box to talk to the infrastructure guys, to talk to the library, and to talk to others. That's the theory, and the theory is a good one. And as I go through the rest of the, the talk, you'll see that practice can also cause lots of different problems where whatever administrative structure you have, you're still going to have problems. So it can only take you so far. <laughs> We had a quick win in 2011, as I said, with the, 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 the policy, with the research data management policy, the so-called Ten Commandments. That was only a step in the, direct, in the direction of addressing this issue. The boxes at the bottom are really where it became very, very difficult for us, for us in terms of implementation. That's where the really tough work started. So let me just pause there and... and Comment a f make a few comments about the library's role, as I see it anyway, and, and the experience we've had at Edinburgh. What was important was that when it came to implementation, and it came to explaining to the academy what we were trying to do, there was a decision made in July 2012 that, that the director of the library, i.e. me, would take the lead role in information services to roll that out, vice principal step back. So there was a, a decision there, and I, I would interpret that decision in certain ways, and that would be, I guess, around the idea that the library has been doing this kind of thing for a long time. I'm a historian as well as a librarian, and I would take it right back to 1580. It's about managing and curating stuff. <laughs> it's about content, and it's about how that will be looked after, and what better brand in the library to be trusted in the academy for that. We know how to manage material, as I've said, but John mentioned this about the recent reputation in op open access. It's been a bumpy journey. 
in the UK for the last couple of years since the Finch report in RC UK. But some of us feel, and I certainly I feel it, I'm not just Pollyanna here, I feel that we've actually got through the most difficult parts of that. And we're beginning to see good and positive results coming out. And using Edinburgh as a small example, even the sceptics are becoming convinced the library can provide solutions for this and get us out the other side of it. And also, hopefully, all the librarians in the room would believe this and understand it and actually sign up for it, that service is at the core of the library ethos. And I quite like this final one here from the Dan's uh, data archiving video on YouTube, that the past is a great source for future knowledge. And it, it really is about data and about other things, that it's not just for now and for publishing, it's about how we're going to make that available, available over time. A couple of words about programme management. All of this is, is vitally important, but actually getting a strong programme in place with a work plan and with milestones and with key understanding about the various responsibilities that those in the university and the support side, and indeed the, the other side of the, the academy, know what is happening and when it will actually happen. It's not the more, most interesting part of this process, but it's absolutely fundamental to get all that right. Get your governance right, get your committees right, make sure that you've got a strong member of the steering board who will chair from the academic side, and make sure you work very, very closely with them. It's a snapshot from our, our new, uh, new, new web page in the university about research data management, and you'll see those various uh, components there. As soon as you put that up, it's not like a wild west town in America in the 19th century. There has to be something behind that. You should, you should be able to click on that and see something that's tangible. When you're f terrified about the fact that you haven't done a data management plan yet, and your grant application has to be in on Friday, and it's Thursday night at <laughs> around about midnight, if you click on that, there should be help. There should be, there should be something behind it that, that, that should help you out. This is a very recent document that we've, we've compiled about the sort of data management life cycle within the university. And we've dropped a, a few, both services and kind of questions and areas we're looking at. And again, if you get, you get into the detail of implementing something like this, it becomes more complicated. You just push, push, push for simplicity. But inevitably, it becomes more complicated. You, more and more things come into the mix. How are we going to do this? How are we going to do retention? How are we going to do deallocation? What is a vault going to look like? What's going to be in it? How long will it be in there? If you put it in, if you put material in, can you get that material out? What about software? We've been talking about software. Uh, and that, th these are all issues that we are we're trying to tackle in a, in a meaningful and systematic way at, at Edinburgh. So it's really evolving thoughts from, from this part on to the end. So where are we now? We've, we've issued half a terabyte of active storage for every researcher at Edinburgh. That's about 9,000 instances of that has gone out. We've got 1.6 petabyte store. And we've got one petabyte in reserve. And that is in reserve. It's not... It's not part of that store. It's not part of the, the sort of three-stage backup that we've gotten from three different sites. And the third one's on tape. It's actually there in reserve because we're anticipating strong take-up with that. And we're also anticipating money coming back to us. We're anticipating a re, uh, an income stream coming back to us for that because in, certainly in the next two or three years, maybe even five years in terms of the contract, we'll need to be buying more storage. Critically and importantly, we've got a quarter of a million for staff as well and operating costs. And that fundamentally changes the game for us. We can bring new people in, we can blend them in with the liaison side, we can blend them in with the IT side, and we can make sure that we're not running a new service on a shoestring. And that has made quite a difference, and that was, that was quite a battle to get that. But we have it, and it's actually in the bottom line, and that will roll through for the three-year three -year pilot phase. In the last few months, we've had a, a very considerable uptake in training. So the, the relationship between giving people very, very good and active storage and solving one of their main problems results in them being willing to converse with you. John mentioned a carrot and stick to converse with you about other things that, that you can help them with. We've just about done our DMP online customization. Our research office is very active now. They're aware of the issues. They're aware of the service that we can offer in the library and information services. And that's beginning to join up. Two things that we've got live, data store, the data store that I've mentioned, and also data share, a way of sharing your data online. 
and that's up, it's working, and we're trialling that with, with all sorts of different types of data. The two things that's given us not headaches, but challenges and imaginative sort of possibilities is data asset register. One of the research councils absolutely want a data catalogue. We think it's a good idea, and we're working through some of those. Now, I'll finish with a couple of slides on, on one or two of these things. And also this suggestion of the data vault, what will that look like, and what will we, what will we do with it? So those are at the spec stage, and we're causing interesting discussions. The key point here also is that we're trying to blend RDM into our business. Not has been a side thing, it's been, you know, it's a program at the moment, but constantly pushing it into the flow of the academy, but in the support area as well, and make sure that it becomes just part of our business. Data asset register diagram there about some of the things it should be doing for us, some of the things that we expect it to do. And there's a lot of demands on that. But if we get that right, then that, that, that should help us quite a bit. However, even recently, we've had discussions about whether we actually need to build a data asset register or whether the CRIS system can actually do that for us. So we are really in that space where we're wondering what might work for us. And we're supposed to come up with serious ideas about this in 2015. So I'm sharing with this with you fairly early. Same with the data vault, that's the 2015 item on our roadmap. How are we going to do that? What, should, what will it look like? And how can it best work for the academics? And in both of those areas, we're having strong conversations with the academics. We're putting groups together and getting named to help us spec that up. What will work for you? The last thing we want to do is say, look at this fantastic thing that we've built. Do you want to use it? So we're, we're trying to do that in the, the kind of opposite way. And I think Monash and some other, other universities are doing a similar thing. I'll end with a, no, I won't end. I've got one more slide, and it's a very important slide, so this is the penultimate one. This is something like the, what it might look like. How would it come together as a, as a set of systems that go from the private side into the public side? And what will you actually see uh, once we've finished in about 18 months' time or two years' time? All of those things I've mentioned, we pop the data asset register right into the middle because we see that as a, as, a, as a kind of hub for metadata and for linking out the way into subject repositories, into CERN, into other places where data will reside. But that data will be generated either by Edinburgh or by partners in a, in a partnership arrangement. And how will, how will all that come together? I hasten to add that a couple of those things are, are at the development stage. And recently, we have really pushed on the CRIS system, which is up there in the, in the top left quadrant, about how much we can sweat that as an asset to do some of this work for us. So it's very much an evolving thoughts there. So now, as a draw to a close, the five lessons learned in one question. Very practical, and sometimes you can forget this. Make sure that everyone understands who's leading on it. And it's not because I'm a megalomaniac or anything like that. It's because it, there needs to be clear understanding about who's leading on this, what the funding is, what the governance is, and make sure that you get a very strong lead in your steering board from the academic side. And if you can do that, it, it does make things a bit easier, especially on the implementation side. Obviously, capital and revenue, make sure the money's there, make sure it's understood where that money is, has been derived from and who is responsible for pulling that in. And one of the kind of mantras that we have is, it's about the service, not the tin. You can buy storage, you can put it up, a lot of spinning disks, it's really about the services that you push towards that. That really gives it that added value. And as I mentioned before, institutional policy and RDM, it's a baby step on the way. At Edinburgh, we probably stepped back and pat patted ourselves in the back for a few months and said, well, I've got that policy up, we beat everyone else to it. And really, it's, it's implementation after that. How do you get the funding to do this? How do you actually change the academy's view and change the culture and see this as something that's absolutely vital? And it's not just the centre building something and saying, there's a lot of compliance coming your way in here. We've got some storage and you really better get on with it. So it really is much more of a partnership. How can we help you? And how can we both work together or, or the various parts of the university to deliver something that's, that's excellent? One thing that might be interesting for librarians, and, and it's certainly something that interests me, is the RDM initiative as part of open access is, is 
is an interesting process in testing your support structures, whether that's in the library or whether it's in the IT services. It does show strengths and it also shows weaknesses. And don't ignore those fissures that you see. You know, confront them and think about them and how you might be able to recast yourself. So, and the library is a, partly as a result of this. We've created a new research and learning services section. And we've dropped our DM into that, along with open access and along with some of the other things. And really, that's making a strong statement that we're using the university strategy as a way of guiding us. And I know others, others in the room have done the same thing, but we've, we've partly used our DM as, a, as an agent of change for our own structures. And John's mentioned it tie into open access and the role in research su support. In Edinburgh, our repositories, which we built a long, long time ago, John was fundamental in making that happen, it's now filling up very, very quickly with papers. 16 to 18,000 papers have gone in in the last two years since the Finch report. That's a paradigm shift, it's a change. And so there, there is something in here about driving that change towards open access, whether it's on the data side and the paper side. And the, if the government of the UK were here, they would argue, David Willits would argue, that that is a way of generating um, a commercial enterprise and small and medium enterprises. So there is, a, there is a wider game here. The government's paying for research. They want to see the outputs in the public domain, and they want to see small companies and others consuming that information, and as a result, possibly transforming the economy as a result. Inside the institution, and inside the library in particular, I'll finish with a question. Does all of this signal a renaissance for research support in the library? And I would argue that it does. Thank you very much.